In this PowerPoint, we're going to take a look at embryonic develop, fetal lung de development, and cardiovascular development. So let's get started with our first slide. This slide is a great slide because it shows you the difference between the pre-embryonic stage, the embryonic stage, and the fetal phase. The pre-embryonic stage is at your far left of the picture and it starts from conception and lasts until implantation, which is about 14 days. And you can see what's going on um, in your picture here. Then we have the embryonic stage and that begins at day 14 and lasts until day 56 and that's in the middle section of your picture. And then the last phase is your fetal phase and that is from nine, the last nine weeks until birth. Interesting to note that during the pre-embryonic stage, this is when the ovum is not susceptible to teratogens. And that's really amazing because during this time, it's not going to be malformed regardless of um, if you've been a drug user or a smoker or a heavy drinker, you have kind of a two-week window where it's not susceptible to malformations. Then in your embryonic stage, this is when the majority of major congenital anomalies or abnormalities occur in response to whether it's a teratogen or um, just a congenital defect. And then in the last uh, phase, during the fetal phase, the last nine weeks to birth, this is when functional defects and minor congenital defects occur. So it's really kind of amazing. Let's go on to your next slide. Okay, again, the pre-embryonic stage is the time from conception into implantation, and this lasts about 14 days. In this picture here, you see uh, a picture of a uh, female reproductive organ ovulating, how it becomes an egg, how that travels down the fallopian tube, it becomes fertilized, and then it shows how the fertilized egg cleaves, and you have a two-cell stage and a four-cell stage, and then that's continues to grow and change into what's called a marula um, and then once it's implanted see it becomes what's called a blastocyst there's a lot of terms within embryonology and you can go on and on it's I'm not looking for you to know all the definitions of these just be familiar that they're a part of the embry pre embryonic stage okay the embryonic stage begins at day 14 and lasts until day 56 this is amazing time in fetal development. Um, this is where the blastocyst actually changes and develops into an embryo, and the different pieces start to separate out into different layers. There's three specific layers, actually, the endoderm, the ectoderm, and the mesoderm. And it's from these specific layers that the different organs are going to be derived. For example, the ectoderm is going to eventually turn into the epidermis, hair, nails, eye, central nervous system and peripheral nervous system, skin and glands. The endoderm is eventually going to become the respiratory tract, digestive tract, bladder, thyroid, liver, and pancreas. And then the mesoderm eventually will become the dermis, muscles, bone, reproductive organs, cardiovascular system, connective tissue, and lymph. So you can see why during this time of fetal development, they're going to be highly at risk for different teratogens and congenital malformations. Let's go on to our next slide. During the fetal stage, that starts at 56 days and continues on into birth. During this time, the major organs are already developed and now they just continue to grow. During this time, they're less susceptible to infection, radiation, and drugs. Remember our different time frames. So during the prenatal period, which is conception to birth, we have the pre-embryonic stage, then the embryonic stage, and then the fetal stage. Then at birth, it becomes a neonate, and that lasts until the first 30 days of life. And after that, it becomes called an infant until it's one year old. Let's go on to our next slide. Okay, we're going to take a closer look at the five stages of fetal lung development. Now, I've outlined them in very detailed fashion for you in the notes section of this PowerPoint, and I highly encourage you to copy and paste those into a Word document to print them off and review them. I'm not going to read through them all.
but please um, pay close attention to some major milestones in fetal lung development. For example, when the diaphragm is formed, when you have 25 generations of your airway, when capillaries are close enough for gas exchange and when they develop, when smooth muscle forms, when true alveoli form, and when the survival outside of the womb is possible. Okay, I'll just to review the five stages, you have the embryonic, also called the embryonal, and this is from conception to week 8. Then you have the pseudoglandular, which is week 7 to 16. Then your canalicular, week 17 to 26. Your saccular, week 27 to birth. And your alveolar, which is birth to 8 years old. Let's go on to our next slide. Okay, in the next couple of slides, we're going to talk about three different types of fluid. The first one being fetal lung fluid. Now, the fetal lung fluid is produced by the pulmonary system. It actually leaks out of the pulmonary circulation's microcirculation. And our pulmonary system makes about or secretes about 250 to 300 milliliters of fluid per day. Now, its function is to keep the airways open while in utero. Um, as our lungs are developing and growing, if there's not enough fluid in the lungs, they can fuse together during development. So one of its functions is to maintain patency of the airways so they don't fuse together during development. Another of its functions is to establish the functional residual capacity. Remember your lung volumes? Well, this is um, to guarantee that um, upon birth, there will be 20 to 30 milliliters per kilogram of volume in their lungs. Now I've provided on there your slide a couple other um, items which will help you differentiate fetal lung fluid from surfactant and amniotic fluid. Let's go on to our next slide. Okay, the next type of fluid we're going to talk about is surfactant. Now this is also produced in the lungs. It's developed by type 2 pneumocytes. So they produce the surfactant, and then the surfactant is reabsorbed by what's called the lamellar bodies, and then they'll resecrete the surfactant, so it recycles it. We can produce it, store it in our lamellar bodies, and then recycle it. The function of surfactant is to reduce inflation pressure, pressures with inspiration, improve lung compliance, improve alveolar stability, and decrease work of breathing. Lack of surfactant is the leading cause of pulmonary complications among neonates. Without it, the lungs become stiff and require lots of energy for the baby just to take one breath. So without surfactant, the baby's going to tire out, become hypoxic and hypoventilated, and eventually die. So it's pretty important. Surfactant is composed of different lipids and proteins and also phospholipids. The two main phosph or two phospholipids include PC, which is phosphatidylcholine, and PG, which is phosphatidylglycerol. Both of these need to be present, with PG being present two times more than PC, or meaning at a ratio of two to one, in order for it to be considered mature surfactant. Now, PC is developed around 24 weeks gestation, and PG is developed around 35 weeks gestation. So it's a fairly acceptable understanding that you can't expect mature surfactant to be present until about 35 weeks gestation. Surfactant production is going to be decreased any time the fetus or neonate experiences hypoxia, hypothermia, or acidosis. So we want to keep a very stable environment for our growing baby. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, amniotic fluid is the last type of fluid I want to talk about for now, and it is secreted primarily from the amniotic membrane for the first 9 to 10 weeks, and then the kidneys begin to add to it as well. Amniotic fluid is dynamic, meaning it's constantly being replenished and absorbed by the body. Um, the first 9 weeks of gestation, it's just made up of water, but then after that, once the kidneys start to help, then it also includes albumin, creatinine, lecithin, sphingomyelin, urea, enzymes, and proteins. There's about 500 milliliters of fluid secreted per day, and at 34 weeks gestation, there should be about 800 milliliters of amniotic fluid, and then as it gets closer to 40 weeks, it actually starts to decrease, and there should only be about 600 milliliters of fluid. So for the first 34 weeks, the amniotic fluid increases in amount, and then the last six weeks, it starts to decrease up until birth. 
The function of amniotic fluid is to protect the fetus from trauma, to provide thermoregulation, and to facilitate movement so the baby can move in there, and also so its limbs cannot fuse together. Um, if there's low amniotic fluid, you can have babies whose um, arms will fuse together because there's not enough room for them to move. There's two terms you need to be familiar with. One is oligohydramnios, and this is when there is less amniotic fluid than what is needed. And this is when you have the limbs start to fuse together. You develop hypoplastic lungs, clubbing feet or hands. The other term is polyhydramnios, and this is when there's more amniotic fluid than what's needed. Um, a predisposing risk for cord prolapse. Um, and it's also associated with esophageal atresia. They're not for sure why, but let's go on to our next slide. Okay, now I'd like to talk about fetal lung maturity because we've identified all three of the types of fluid that get mixed together in the amniotic fluid. You have your amniotic fluid, your fetal lung fluid, and your surfactant. And because the baby mimics respirations in utero, it's pushing, sucking amniotic fluid into its lungs and pushing lung fluid and surfactant out of its lungs. So in the amniotic fluid itself, those three all mix together. We can actually take a sample of that out with a big needle, put it in mom's belly, withdraw some of that amniotic fluid, and we can test it to see if baby's lungs are mature. And this is called, uh, the procedure to do it is called an amniocentesis, but the test is called an LS ratio. And we're looking at lethicin versus sphingomyelin, or you could also say we're looking at PC versus PG, because lethicin is the same thing as PC, and sphingomyelin is the same thing as PG. So if you have an LS ratio of 2 to 1, that means your baby's lungs are mature. If you have a LS ratio of 1 to 1, that means your lungs are immature, meaning they're going to probably go into respiratory distress if they're born at that time. So you need more PC than PG. Um, typically, the lungs become mature at 35 weeks of age. Um, the best indicator of lung maturity is really to do a lung profile, and that's where they look at the LS ratio, and then they also check for the presence of PG alone, and if you have both of those come up in a positive light, then you have, you're pretty sure those lungs are mature. Let's go on to our next slide. There are some other tests they can do to test for lung maturity. They're not as popular, although some are growing in popularity. There's the shake foam test, and this is where you mix the amniotic fluid with ethanol, shake it up for about 15 seconds, and if there's a ring of bubbles in the ethanol, then that indicates the surfactant is mature. That's a little subjective, though. There's also a surfactant albumin ratio, also called the SAR. There's also the TDX FML assay. It's a high predictor of respiratory distress syndrome or there's the fluorescence polarization, the FP. If you have a baby who does have immature lungs, um, you can give corticosteroids to the mother by IV. Um, a common dose being used these days is betamethasone at six milligrams or um, dexamethasone at six milligrams. Uh, both of those being given to the mother will help induce lung maturity in the fetus. It'll cause the fetus to make more surfactant on its own, but it has to be done 48 hours prior to delivery for it to be effective. Let's go on to our next slide. Okay, so we've taken a look at how the fetus's lungs develop and how we can tell if their lungs are mature and ready to survive outside of the womb, but what we still don't know is how the fetus breathes. That's what we're going to talk about now. We're going to talk about the placenta because the role of the placenta is that it's the respiratory organ of the fetus. Now there's a concentration gradient which exists between the fetal blood and the maternal blood and this allows for transfer of nutrients and oxygen to pass to the fetus and it allows for waste materials and CO2 to pass to the mother without their blood ever mixing together. So it's pretty amazing if you think about it. In your picture you're going to see on your far right of your screen you see your endometrium and so you see your maternal vein, which is blue, and your maternal artery, which is, which is red. And then that um, is feeding into, or that's connected to, the fetal portion of the placenta. That funny thing on your screen that looks like a tree, uh, we actually call 
that whole thing is called a uh, cotyledon. That whole little box thing is the cotyledon. The tree inside there and its little branches, those are actually called chronic villi. The little tiny spaces in between the branches, those are called the intervillous spaces. And that is where the maternal blood um, pools and then it passes the concentration gradient across the chronic villi and that inside the chronic villi is actually the fetal arteries and veins. That's a, one fetal artery and one fetal vein make up the chronic, each of those chronic villi. So the, the chronic villi then feed into the umbilical cord and obviously the fetal veins make up the umbilical vein and the fetal artery make up the umbilical arteries. So the umbilical cord then goes to the fetus and you would think that the oxygenated blood is going to go through the arteries, right? Well, it doesn't. The oxygenated blood actually travels through the umbilical vein and it goes into the fetus into the inferior vena cava whereas the umbilical arteries come off the iliac veins of the fetus and they are actually taking the unoxygenated blood from the fetus and returning it to the placenta. So oxygenated blood goes to the fetus through the umbilical vein and deoxygenated blood goes through the umbilical arteries back to the placenta. If you have any questions on this, please post it. Um, I do want to add one more thing. The PaO2 for the umbilical arteries is around 20 and the PaO2 for the umbilical veins is right around 30. Let's go on to our next slide. Okay, so as I mentioned before, there's a uh, concentration gradient between the mom and the fetus. That concentration gradient has to be there. It provides nutrients for the fetus and it allows the fetus to get rid of, rate, rid of waste without the blood ever mixing. It is a neat little fact though that the hemoglobin inside the fetus has a higher affinity for oxygen than does adult or maternal blood and they think that's why they can withstand such a low PaO2 because as I mentioned before the PaO2 inside the umbilical vein is right around 30 and in the umbilical artery is right around 20. Uh, as far as CO2 goes in the umbilical vein the CO2 is right around 40 and in the umbilical artery the CO2 is right around 50. The pH for the umbilical vein is right between 7.3 and 7.5 and the pH in the umbilical artery is right around 7.2 to 7.3 so it's just opposite of what a normal adults would be. Pretty close anyway. The PO2 is lower but let's go on to our next slide. Okay, um, for this slide, the, we're going to take a look at the cardiovascular development. And what I'd really like you to do is review the cardiovascular animations on this slide. You should just be able to click on that where it says cardiovascular animations, and it'll take you to another website that's really cool that you can see um, cardiovascular development. Some main things I do want you to know is that by the end of week three, the heart begins to form, and um, within two months the heart is the first major organ to be completely developed um, and that's by week eight. Um, there's some other key points during this time for example at 21 days that's when two tubes are formed and fused together to form a single chamber. By week four the blood begins to move back and forth within the heart tubes. Uh, by week five it looks like an adult heart although it's not functioning like one. By week six the pulmonary artery and aorta are form forming and at the end of two months again it is a completely formed heart that is the first major organ to be developed. But please watch that web link if you'll take a look at that. Then let's go on to our next slide. Okay let's take a look at fetal circulation. Now generally you're going to hear respiratory therapists and maybe some physicians say that fetal circulation is backwards from adult circulation and that's a very fine thing to say but let's see what that means. Let's take a look. 
So in your picture here you can see where the uh, placenta is supposed to be and you have your umbilical vein where oxygenated blood travels into the fetus and it, it goes right into the inferior vena cava and we're going to come along three separate shunts in fetal circulation. The first one is right at the liver and this shunt is called the ductus venosus and it's literally taking part of the blood supply and going around the liver rather than through it. So about 50% of the blood actually travels through the liver and the other 50% is shunted through the ductus venosus and continues up the inferior vena cava. And then the blood that went through the liver, that 50%, it feeds back into the inferior vena cava and then 100% of that blood goes on up into the right atrium. So our first shunt is right at the liver, about 50% of blood is shunted around the liver. Okay, so in the right atrium is where we're going to see our second shunt, and this shunt is called the foramen ovale, and it actually is between the right atria and the left atria. Now the majority of the blood that comes up from the inferior vena cava, the majority of that blood is actually going to flow right through that foramen ovale straight into the left atria. There's a, a one-way leaflet valve on this foramen ovale, so blood is able to pass through it into the left atria, but it's not able to pass back into the right atria. It's just a one-way valve. So it goes into the left atria, blood that travels through the foramen ovale, then goes from the left atria to the left ventricle, and then on out the aorta, and so on and so forth. So about 90% of the blood that comes from the inferior vena cava is actually going to travel through the right atria into the foramen ovale and then the left atria. Okay, but let's assume, so we get to the right atria, we have blood coming from the inferior vena cava and we also have blood coming back through the superior vena cava that has gone around the brain and upper body. So the blood that comes through the superior vena cava the majority of that blood is going to come in and go from the right atria through the valve into the right ventricle. From there it's going to go on into the pulmonary artery where we see our third shunt called the ductus arteriosus. Now this is located on the pulmonary artery and it connects to the aorta. So the blood that comes from the right ventricle, about 90% of that blood shunts through the ductus arteriosus directly into the aorta. It totally bypasses the whole left side of the heart. The remaining lung blood in the pulmonary artery then perfuses around the lungs, the collapsed lungs, remember, and goes on to the left atria, then to the left ventricle, and then out the aorta. So again, we have three shunts in our heart, or in, in our body, the first one being at the ductus venosus at the liver, the second one being the foramen ovale, which blood flows from the right side of the heart directly to the left atria, and then we have the ductus arteriosus, where 90% of that blood goes from the pulmonary artery directly to the aorta. So there's actually only about 10% of the overall blood perfusing the lungs or traveling around the lung tissue. Let's go on to our next slide. Okay, so I said that some people re will refer to circulation as being backwards, and you know, who really cares? Well, there is something important about it. Because the lungs are completely collapsed, and because the PaO2 in the fetus is so low, the pulmonary blood vessels are very, very constricted. And so the pulmonary vascular resistance is super, super high. It's really hard for that blood to travel through there. Again, it's due to there being low lung volumes, the lungs are completely collapsed, which collapses the vessels. Then you have your low oxygen concentrations, which causes pulmonary vasoconstriction. Um, and both of those things cause your pulmonary vascular resistance to be really, really high. Okay? Now, if you look at the placenta, all the blood flow is going to dump into the placenta and the placenta has actually very very low resistance to blood flow. So we have this fetus that on the right side of the heart the pressures are going to be really high because of the pulmonary vasoconstriction and that high pulmonary vascular resistance but on the left side of the heart the pressures are going to be really really low because it's dumping into the placenta. The placenta actually holds 50 percent of the fetus's blood volume.
Isn't that amazing? So placenta low resistance, pulmonary vascular resistance is super duper high. Now in an adult, which side of the heart has high resistance? That's right, in an adult we have high systemic vascular resistance and very low pulmonary vascular resistance. So when they talk about circulation being reversed, they're not just talking about blood flow because it's not really backwards. It's backwards that the oxygenated blood's in the umbilical vein and whatnot, but they're also talking about the pressures and the heart. They're completely switched from what an adults are. Let's go on to our next slide. Okay, I want to talk about the factors that influence our first breath. There are three major ones. The first one is during labor, the, the contractions are actually disrupting the blood flow to the fetus. Remember, the placenta is uh, the respiratory organ in utero, and so during contractions, it's being, it's being squeezed and blood flow is getting cut off. So although baby's normal PaO2 maybe was 30 in utero, during each contraction, its PO2 is dropping, so it's being asphyxiated. Remember that asphyxiation stimulates the chemoreceptors in our brain, which in turn stimulate the respiratory center in our brain, which signals the muscles to perform the actions that's needed for our first breath. So one of our first stimuli for our first breath is asphyxia, normal asphyxia, during labor. The next stimulus is, um, as the baby has to pass through the birth canal, its thorax is going to be compressed significantly, and that's going to help squeeze that fetal lung fluid out of the lungs, but then also once the baby comes out of the birth canal, its chest is actually going to be able to recoil and expand to its normal size, which will create a pressure change and allow air to enter the lungs. So there's another stimulus. And then we have our third stimulus, and this one to me has to be the worst one of all. Um, we have this nice fetus growing inside a quiet dark, warm environment, and we remove it from that environment to a cold, bright, loud environment that it has never been around before. So you have this sensory um, or environmental changes stimulus that's going to cause the baby to cry and stimulate its first breath. Let's go on to our next slide. Okay, so once the first breath is taken, this allows uh, pressure changes to start to occur on the right side of heart due to the initiation of breathing. And what's going to happen on the right heart is our pulmonary vascular resistance is going to decrease. Um, as the baby takes its first breath, it's going to inflate the lungs. This stretches the parenchyme. The stretching of the parenchyme does a couple of things. First of all, it inhibits the production of vasoconstricting agents produced by the lungs. Um, it also uh, is going to mechanically expand the vasculature. So as the baby takes its first breath, it's inflating the lungs. It also establishes the FRC, and then it's also going to increase the PaO2. Increasing the PaO2 causes a release of vasodilators, which relaxes smooth muscle on the pulmonary vessels. So it takes all of these things to decrease the pulmonary vascular resistance. Let's go on to our next slide. So inflating the lungs was one of the main things that helped decrease the pulmonary vascular resistance and decrease the pressures on the right side of the heart, but now let's take a look at how the pressures changes on the left side of the heart are going to change. Again, a once the cord is clamped, the placenta is no longer going to have low resistance. The arterial resistance, or the SVR, is going to increase because there isn't an easy passage of blood flow into the placenta any longer. As this SVR increases, the pressure inside the left atria is eventually going to overcome the pressure in the right atria because your pulmonary vascular resistance is decreasing with the initiation of breathing and then your systemic vascular resistance is increasing due to the clamping of the cord. So what this is going to do is it's going to force the flap of the foramen ovale closed and so the blood that enters the right atria is now all going to go through its valve into the right ventricle and on through the pulmonary artery. So now we have 100% of the blood traveling through the pulmonary artery, which means we're going to have increased oxygenation because we have more blood available to travel around the lungs and perfuse them. This is going to lead to the 
closing of the ductus arteriosus. The ductus arteriosus, in order for it to close, we have to have an increase in our PaO2. By increasing the PaO2, prostaglandin production decreases, which causes the ductus arteriosus to constrict and close on its own. Let's go on to our next slide. Okay, this little algorithm is very helpful if you're struggling to identify and keep track of all the different factors that are going to affect how the pressures within the heart or fetal circulation is going to change. So on the left side of your picture you see uh, the darker purple boxes identify fetal circulatory pattern and it tells you that there's decreased pulmonary blood flow which translates to a high PVR, there's increased lung fluid, and there's a decreased systemic artery pressure or a low SVR. Okay, so back up to your top box there, the fetal circulatory pattern. With the stimulus, the fetus will start to breathe air, and that causes lung expansion. Lung expansion does two things. It increases your PaO2, and it decreases your PCO2. Both of those are important for decreasing your pulmonary vascular resistance. Your PaO2 is especially important for your ductus arteriosus to close. But both the closing of your ductus arteriosus and your decreasing pulmonary vascular resistance can help bring down your pulmonary artery pressures, decreasing your right heart pressure, which helps your foramen ovale closes, along with help from your systemic vascular resistance increasing, which you have to kind of follow your box back now, due to the cord being clamped, which decreases umbilical and placental blood flow which helps the ductus venosus close and then also increases your systemic vascular resistance. So if all of those things are in play, then you get to the right side in the red boxes, which is an adult circulatory pattern, increase pulmonary blood flow, decrease lung fluid, and increase systemic artery pressure, or SVR. Let's go on to our next slide. Okay, so now imagine that what would happen if one step in the flow chart wouldn't occur. So if we were to take away the breathing of air, let's say the baby did not initiate its first breath, the stimulus was there, but let's say it did not stimulate its first breath. We still clamped the cord, we still did everything else. Is the baby going to transition to adult circulatory pattern? The answer is not without some help. You see, if we eliminate that box from the algorithm, lung expansion would, won't occur and we won't have the chain of events necessary in order for the fetus to change to adult circulatory pattern. So in this case, we would have to ventilate the baby for it, meaning a bag valve mask, applying positive, pre positive pressure ventilation to help it breathe. Let's try another one. What if we Let's, what if the fetus did not have a decrease in its PaCO2? What would happen? When you think you have the answer, go on to the next slide. Okay, in this situation, the pulmonary vascular resistance would only be able to decrease if, according to the increase in PaO2, you wouldn't have help from the decrease in PaCO2. So everything would probably happen as it's supposed to. It might just take a little bit longer. Let's go on to our next slide, but before you do, what would happen if our PaO2 did not increase? Okay, if we did not have PaO2 increase, then the ductus arteriosus is not going to be able to close, and our pulmonary vascular resistance is not going to be able to decrease as much as it should. So we'd have persistent fetal circulation. We'd still have high right heart pressures um, because the pulmonary vessels wouldn't be able to vasodilate. Um, because they'd still be constricted because there's no PaO2. Let's do one more. Let's say the ductus arteriosus is not going to close. What would happen then? Okay, if our ductus arteriosus did not close, then our pulmonary artery pressures would not be able to decrease all the way. Our heart pressures would not be, right heart pressures would not be able to decrease all the way, and our foramen ovale wouldn't be able to close all the way. So we have, again, what's called persistent fetal circulation. All of these are possible problems that we are going to address when we're talking about uh, neonates in the upcoming chapters. That concludes this PowerPoint.